Good afternoon, everybody. It's about 19th of August, 2023, and what I just, uh, well, maybe I put it on after I talk here. It's uh, a bust of Lenin. I got off on uh, Ploshad Lenin, a Lenin plots here in Minsk. And here I'm going to show you, look, a beautiful flower garden. And this is the same metro stop as the main train station, but uh, I went off on a different part of the metro, a different exit, and I don't know where I'm at. I'll just show you around a little bit here. This is some big government building here, huge. So, and I think there's supposed to be a shopping mall around here. Actually, my purpose was to go to a, oh, I see the gates of Minsk through there. You probably can't tell with this lens, but these uh, towers on a tower are the gates of Minsk, I do believe, with the statue on there. Uh-oh, some soldiers coming to get me. You see them? <laughs> no, anyway. But I was actually trying to find a different uh, uh, shopping mall. Not really. I wanted to go inside or anything. Just wanted to walk past it. watermelons anybody so I should uh, get right down to things I showed you that beautiful garden because uh, I'll talk about Joseph Burrell a little bit a little bit later and uh, let me see if I can find my notes didn't take those out But mostly I'm going to be talking a lot about Africa today. That seems to be a real tinderbox over there, down there. <laughs> and we know that there's somebody behind all this, maybe more than one or two players. You know, you've got France and uh, we see the ECOWAS, the Eastern, or no, the Economic <laughs> What it, now I don't, don't even know. I, I thought I had that memorized. I know what that means. Economic Community of East African or West Af wait, West African States. Yeah, West African States. So they are. They said they're ready for war now. Isn't that strange? You know, you have an overthrow of a government of a country called Ukraine and the European community is perfectly fine with that perfectly fine with that but yet they have to go to war against uh, some small country in Africa that unfortunately had a uh, Western puppet dictator leader that the people didn't like so what was it it's, uh, I think I mentioned that in the last video, it was like 73% of the people are in favor of the coup government. And the coup government is in favor of Russia, but the, Russia said that they would rather, just for the sake of real democracy, they would rather have the, um, let's see what this black is, they'd rather have the other government reinstalled because it was, democratically elected, even though they have went to the dark side, I guess. Mm. That's uh, how legalistic Russia is, I tell you. And the United States, as you notice, in their own way, they just like, they don't go by laws. I think that was something just put out by Paul Craig Roberts in an interview uh, just a few days ago, that there is no rule of law. There is no rule of law in the States. Whatever suits them at the time is the new law. I guess that's what you call the the new law, law-based order. There's a nice park over there. I should head over there. I guess I can walk here anytime. There's no light. Not so over there. 
I'll show you, there's the delivery people here, and this is normally what they look like. This is from Yandex. And as you see, insulated uh, backpacks and things like that for delivering food, pizzas, and all that sort of thing. We're all waiting for the light here. ladies over there I'm waiting for this guy so I should be talking shouldn't I but recently what it was pretty funny what uh, what uh, Niger, the Niger, the new Niger government told uh, told the rest of the well told the colonial powers. <laughs> they told the United States. Well, first they told France, "We're not sending any more uranium or gold to you." As you know, that uh, they've been, uh, France has been getting gold and uranium and lots of other minerals from Niger that next to nothing prices, you know, at 5% of what the real cost of those things are. And then, of course, they make huge, huge profits at it. And the country of Niger, very poor, even though they're rich in minerals and rich in resources, yet a poor country. Normally, if you had a Western country, that really normally wouldn't be the case. But everybody, even the rich countries, they all have to send a portion of it always to the United States. And of course, that's another point that Paul Craig Roberts brought up the other day is since there is still a reserve currency, normally any kind of transactions anywhere, a portion of that is always going to the United States, whether they earned it or deserve it or not. You know, And then if they ever get in any sort of troubles anyway, they just print more money. And everybody has to accept it. And now that the so-called, I guess you'd say a multipolar world is now rebelling against this, and they're all trying to find ways to get out of the dollar because they see what happened to Russia. You know, if you don't do what we tell you to do, you're gonna be punished. I wanna go over on the sunny side of the street, so I'm heading back here. <laughs> so everybody's trying to get away from this and trade in their own currencies. Paul Craig Roberts also put out that there is no need for a reserve currency anymore, a world reserve currency. And then they ask the... <laughs> oh, the guy got a nice smile. Then they ask the, uh, the Russians, which currency do they prefer? Apparently it's the Chinese one. So I guess it was a huge majority said that they would rather, if they have to take some other foreign currency, they would take the the Chinese currency, not the euro, and not the U.S. dollar, or nothing else. So that's fascinating, isn't it? But what else they said? The Niger government, they told the United States, and I guess everybody is uh, because they're they're not doing what they're told. You know, even though this coup was nonviolent, I don't think anybody got shot or killed or anything. Unlike the United States coup in Ukraine, where, as we see, they were still experiencing the repercussions of that coup d'etat. And you could easily say that it, by now, that it's probably somewhere very close to a half a million people have died because of the United States coup d'etat. And of course, they were trying to th overthrow the Belarusian government before that. Well, that was supposed to be in the plan, is that first Belarus and then Ukraine, but it didn't quite work out, luckily, that way. Well, luckily for me, anyway, I'm living here in Belarus right now, but um, you know, I saw like a month ago, I think a lot of you saw that in, uh, before, I, I don't know if it was the Senate or the House, and Victoria Nuland says they're not gonna give up on uh, regime change in Belarus. And as I mentioned before, it was, I think, not this past May, but the May before that, um, they were gonna, assassinate the entire family of the leading 
of the president of, uh, of Belarus, Lukashenko's family. They wanted to assassinate all of them. And that plot was discovered. And part of that plot, I don't know if, I, I still have to find, get clear on that because it seemed too unbe unbelievable to me. It was somehow to do with either some rogue Wagner people or, um, or they were supposed to be Wagner and it was somehow filtered through the Ukraine. So the Ukraine, that was even before the uh, military operation. They were trying, yeah, obviously, because that was the whole deal to try to overthrow the government here before, before they started in Ukraine. And of course, all of this stuff has come out now and they've all admitted this thing. Very interesting. And they were supposed to act like, uh, well, that's not all true, even though they've admitted it. Incredible how the world works, isn't it? We're supposed to have selective memories on things we don't want to believe. So we just forget them or, uh, you know, and then you have some uh, other politician come up and say, oh, that's not true, even though others said it is true. <laughs> what Niger said is the United States, basically they told them to take their, their aid, which I'm sure they're cut off by now, just like everybody else is cutting them off. If you don't do what the global establishment wants, we're going to cut you off from everything. Didn't work that well with Russia, of course, but, <laughs> but you know, these smaller countries in... It's, it's a little bit more precarious. And uh, what uh, Niger basically said to the United States is you can take your aid and stick it where the sun doesn't shine. What they said actually was that you should take your aid and you should apply it to the United States and solve your own problems first. Your mass amount of homeless people on the streets. And I don't know if they said it, but of course they would also mean get rid of some of the drug problems of all the, you know, what is it? Uh, 100,000 people die of overdose drug problems in the United States every year, primarily fentanyl. So, yeah, I guess maybe they said homelessness and drug addictions rather than overthrowing popular governments. Yeah, it's sort of like uh, I was writing down here too. It was uh, it reminds me of like a schoolyard bully, you know? You know, usually when, uh, if say, they like to go and beat up on kids and steal their lunch money, you know, that's like what the United States and the West in general does. And, and um, if you go to beat up somebody as a bully and they don't have any lunch money, uh, you, then you beat them up even more. So I guess that's about what's happening right now to uh, Niger. They, they don't have any lunch money at the moment or they're not gonna give up their lunch money. So they're getting ready and they're sending the ECOWAS in there to take over. So the big bully is the West and their gang, in this case, is the Ecovoss. You know, that's their little NATO. Their little NATO and that uh, that serves to to bully half of Russia. And it makes you really wonder, um, you know, how the U.S. does. They, they, um, they use threats you either do this or you're going to be in trouble or we'll do that and a lot of time they use both they have a little bit of positive as in ukraine for example you know as you know lewinsky is getting fabulously rich and uh apparently he's been getting some negative too you know you either do this or this will happen to you and of course as you know his security you know his uh, personal security are british so, I mean, that's been put out many times. They speak English and they're British. So, makes you wonder if that's a check on him as well. You know, you have the check of the, the neo-nasties and you have the check from the other side. So you have the... So you have the British and the West, basically, which is what that is on the one side and you have the nasties on the other side. So, but I'm not saying that Zelensky is so innocent. I guess he's going along with this sort of stuff. Maybe he needs that uh, powdered sugar to help him cope with what he's doing and sending all of those people to de their demise. Hmm. I guess to the tune of over 400,000 already and they're trying to make up bigger graveyards. <laughs> yes, but anyway, another thing I was going to talk about, this is what I, this is where the gardens come in, the beautiful gardens. Everywhere you look here in uh, 
Belarus, there's something nice, at least in the summertime, you know, nice areas. So I've made it around and now I'm coming towards, well, the train station is over here, but this is another part over there. I was, I'll make it to that one city mall. I'll go there. Maybe I'll shut this off right now and I'll continue when I get to the other side. Okay, I'm back. I made it to the other side. Had an adventure with a alcoholic, well, he's a young guy, young guy, drunk, from Latvia. He knew a couple words in English. I knew some words in Russian. But anyway, well, I, I noticed something coming out of this underpass. Look at this. Does that look familiar? If you saw my last video, you saw something just like that. So anyway, I'm kind of in a new area right now. When I first came to Belarus, it was like, you know, maybe it's more than 18 months now. Anyway, this area right here was kind of a large section. This was, it's kind of new. It's a, it's an area that are apparently developing commercially and residentially, residentially, maybe a little bit, mostly commercially. So a lot of shops here and it's not really um, yet super, super busy, but much, I went here in the meantime. I think I was here maybe six months ago and there was really nothing. But now, of course, there's a lot more people going on and it looks like a place for buses. Wow, that round part has kind of an old Soviet look to it. This little uh, place where shops, there's flowers, coffee, and vegetables and fruit. <laughs> My Russian's a little slow reading. So, a oh, place for kvass, I don't, I don't know, maybe I have two rubles, very nice. But anyway, I was coming over here mostly to see this, this new shopping mall. And when I was here six months ago, I think they had just opened up and there's some people, you know, opening up some shops in here. Oh, look, here is the Belarusian, not the Russian, the Belarusian version of who took over for McDonald's. It's a sign here, seven rubles, 50. For that looks like a cherry turnover some cheese sauce chicken McNuggeties french fries and a coke and I'll tell you what I've eaten already there before and I, I love the french fries you get a lot of french fries for a low price I don't think anybody in Belarus even can beat that price for how many french fries and they're very good french fries probably from Belarus Belarus is now a big country for potatoes they really have been pushing potato, growing potatoes for a long time. Not just potatoes, a lot of other things. Flax, linen, you know, linen, what they uh, make clothing from. And if I, there's a lady there, she had something, probably linen. I tell you what, I'm not so crazy about linen. Mm. Me personally, I think I, it's, a, it's like cotton. It's a natural fabric made from plants rather than wool or polyester, you know, which is fake stuff. I, actually, I like nylon, <laughs> even though it's not a natural fiber. I like cotton a lot, I'm wearing cotton. If I haven't said it already, I'm wearing my Africa shirt. Got an elephant on here. I believe it's written in Danish. So I don't know if I really want to go inside of this mall. It's like I said, it's still kind of beginning. And one of these, I think I passed it already. I didn't point it out to you. It was a supermarket. It's a lot of, uh, well, the prices are fairly good, but a large uh, selection of foods and anything else that has to do with additives, pastas or whatever, cheeses, anything. Very, very good. It's called green. tour bus. Just walk here to the street and then maybe I'll just walk in the mall even though it's fairly new.
one of the only last things I wanted to say about the news is it was a bold statement by Sergei Lavrov and he was talking about Joseph Joseph jungle Joseph Borel and I think it's mostly to point out the total arrogance of these people these unelected people that are for democracy so, let's look around in here oh, nice and cool here future world. This is where you can lock up your bags before you go shopping into the supermarket here. And I believe this must be the entrance to the supermarket. Yes, there it is. some guy with a mango anyway it's it's a shopping mall I just I wanted to show you that let's go out this exit here I like I said I don't know this area too well there's a lady with linen see that orangey dress more likely linen or linen mix if you know what linen is so let's get on to Lavrov he made a bold statement he was talking uh, <laughs> he called a roundabout way you know how diplomats are there at least good diplomats I'm not talking about some of uh, like Baerbach or some of these jokers, even Joseph Perel himself is not really a, he doesn't talk like a diplomat. Blinken, I don't know, maybe he's kind of a little bit sort of a diplomatic. He's got at least some skill in talking sort of like one, but nobody is as good as Jaikan Shah from, uh, from India or those from China or, or Lavrov. These are very skilled speaking people. But he, in his, in his roundabout way, he basically said, well, he said that Borrell has a racist view. And he said, yes, I'm not afraid to use that word. So in other words, he was basically saying, Borrell is a racist. Because mostly about that statement, we live in a beautiful garden in the EU and the United States, actually the West, and all the rest of the world is a jungle. So everybody else is uncivilized. Just like I've been showing you how uncivilized it is here in uh, Belarus, but this kind of development has nothing to do with being civilized. You know, look at how many uh, murders occur in those other countries. You know, drugs on the streets and uh, homelessness, but yet that's civilized. Overthrowing governments, that's a civilized way to act, you know? Trying to leave countries like Belarus alone is not, it's not, not in their, it's not in their plans, not in their plans at all. Or Russia, provocations to try to get somebody else to actually make the first move like they did with Russia, you know. But of course, they were making the first moves anyway. They were bombing Donbass for eight years. They just made sure that it never meant, went to the press and nobody found out about it. And they wanted everybody to think that... Uh, Vladimir Putin just woke up one morning, put his slippers on, and said, I'm going to invade Ukraine. <laughs> I'm going to take over that country when taking over Ukraine is not any part of the objectives. Just think if the West would have just played dead and stopped giving weapons or allowed the peace process to come through. Zelensky would have even still been there. They probably would have even kept the entire Donbass area. The only thing they would have really lost was the Crimea and they act as if that's what they really want. But it's not them that really wants, as I keep saying, that's the West. The West wants the Crimea. That's their future military base. That is their base to completely like destabilize and neutralize, neutralize Russia. And that was their whole goal and it's been the goal since I've ever known. 
since in the 1980s, even when I was learning about this stuff, when I heard the military people talking when I was in the army saying, yeah, you know, if they could just take that, that mili uh, naval base away from Russia and the Crimea, then, then we've got Russia, then it's over for Russia. So, and like I said, I'm always so, you know, I'm always just surprised that you don't, we don't even hear that from Colonel Douglas McGregor or even uh, Scott Ritter. When I heard that so many times, that that has always been the goal. I'm just so shocked, I'm so shocked. I guess I'm, I might be one of the only ones that talks about that, that that has been a goal for US foreign policy for, you know, at least to kick Russia out of the Crimea. It's been the goal for a long, long time, probably long before I was learning about it in the earlier to mid 1980s. So what else did he say? He said the EU, and I'm sure he meant others, are afraid of the prospect of losing the opportunity of living off the rest of the world like parasites, ensuring faster economic growth for themselves at the expense of the rest of the world. Those are almost his exact words. I'm sort of paraphrasing, but that's what he said, that they're afraid of losing their domination, basically, over all the rest of the world. Somebody has more something more important to say there. <laughs> so, yes, they're afraid of the prospect of losing the opportunity of living like parasites off the rest of the world. And as you know what he's talking about like that, he's referring not only to what's going on in Africa with Niger, but he's also referring to Russia. And then not only that, I don't really know that they've ever really lived from Belarus, but they see that Belarus has actually been quite successful. It's uh, uh, Alexander Lukashenko said that the, what is it? The potential for Belarus to be a great agricultural nation is not that big. And yet they've still achieved great success in agriculture, which is a very tremendous testament to the leadership of this country as well as the people of the country and agriculture because they don't really have that much, much potential, apparently. Maybe it's partly to do with the soils, a lot to do with the climate, of course, and there are other things. Uh, Belarus generally is uh, a lot of swamps. There's a lot of swampy land that they've gotten rid of a lot of that, but various ways, but they don't have any sea to pump it to or areas to move it to like Holland did. Holland was had a lot of swamps and then the uh, windmills and pumping this and building dikes and this and then actually they reclaimed a lot of land from the sea from doing it their way but Belarus doesn't have that option so they've done very well on that. That's just one point. No seaport at all. You know if you don't have a port you've got to pay to get any of your products that you have to get them to some other port and you've got to rent facilities there. It's just not that easy and no great resources. They don't have any oil. They don't have any gold here. Nothing like that. No uranium. So you wonder how this country can be functioning as it is. And a lot of that has to do with leadership, but I don't know. A lot of people wouldn't want me to talk about that because then it sounds like, it sounds like propaganda. So, but Lavrov, he's talking about generally the West, what they do to every country. And as I said, they never really had control of Belarus because they really never did want to. But now they do. Belarus has a tremendous industry. And as I said, that's coming from here and from here, from Belarusian people. That is uh, great engineering, great education. And uh, not only that, very peaceful people, makes it very stable very much different than in the United States. You know, I remember growing up, you know, a lot of time you have to worry about getting beaten up. And then there's, even in my day, drugs, there was drugs in the school. We're talking about, when, when was that? That's in the seventies. <laughs> That's in the seventies, mid, even in the mid to late seventies, drugs, crime. And even, uh, I remember once, another one of my little tangents here, I, um, there was somebody bothering one of my friends or something like that. So we kind of a little bit bothered him. And then he went, he was actually in a gang. I wasn't 
didn't really know so much about that. But then I obviously I found out that he was in a gang. And um, so the, the big gang leader, he came up to me and right in the school building where there's a lot of students around and he picked a fight with me. And I actually bested the guy. I put him in a headlock and I just stayed there and I just held his head the whole time. And then a teacher came and broke it up. Um, anyway, they don't call me Duke for nothing, seriously. But in the days, those days, I, I, I would, I got in fights, I'll tell you that. I'm a kind of a willful type of person, but anyway. So anyway, I had this guy in a headlock and then, so I don't know if it was the same day or the day after that, all of a sudden, you know, they ganged up the entire gang. They uh, chased me down. I was trying to run home. I'm pretty fast actually, but I don't know. Maybe I made a wrong turn because I know I'm faster than them, but somehow they got me. And luckily it was by another school, uh, an elementary school. And one teacher was going and getting into her car and, and things like that, even though maybe it was 40 or 50 meters away. And uh, you know, they proceeded on me and I just went down onto the ground, curled up in a ball and all they could do they can throw some punches, of course, you know, but I had my, my head and my arms and I don't know how many were there. There was one, two, three, four, I think maybe five, five of them. So I curled up in a ball and they were kicking me. And of course they had boots because, well, they were drug dealers and things like that too. So they were, they had boots on and, uh, and were kicking me. And then they saw the teacher. She was probably looking, I, I don't know. I couldn't see because I was I had my face covered up. So she was probably looking. So anyway, they, they gave up, walked away. And actually, luckily, I never got any trouble from them ever since that time. Actually, they were just doing it for this little peep squeak of their gang. So maybe to show that, uh, yeah, we love you too. And later on, one of these people, and I'm not even sure quite which one I remember, but it was there was two brothers. And it's strange that I remember these people's names. Um, the big gang member, his name was Kelly Sherman, and uh, the assistant big gang member, uh, his name, I believe, was Steve Brooks, and his brother was in the gang, which was Dan Brooks. So you could say the Brooks brothers, but they didn't make suits. They, they, they're not part of that. The Brooks brothers who make suits in New York City for, for all of the best dressed people over there. <laughs> but one of them, sometime many years after high school and this was actually in junior high school I think like towards the later years of the junior high I'm not so I'm not so old I'm very old but not not super super old so but that was in junior high school like I'm saying that was about a year something about um, maybe 1975 or 6 or something like that 76 76 77 maybe and anyway one of them he ended up in prison. He had raped and murdered a small boy, one of these Brooks brothers. Again, I'm not quite sure which one of them. So I guess they didn't have a very good destiny. But I'm just saying that there's a lot of this culture, they don't really have that much here. They don't, uh, that sort of thing really doesn't happen over here. And it's very much uh, pacifist. And you don't, nobody's ever trying to beat anybody up. I saw once some guys pestering, and I told you about this already, pestering some guy that was wearing an earring, you know, and it, it wasn't, the guy, that guy was actually bigger than they are, and I think it was only two of these guys, and they're kind of like, I don't know, <laughs> guys that carry bags of cement for a living or something, so, and the other guy was a little bit more sophisticated, the guy wearing an earring, if he was whatever they think he was, I don't know, but um, along with that, let's segue into something, as uh, Rich, Alex Christophora would say, talking about, uh, these homosexuality and all that sort of thing. You see now, now the new country that has got funding cut from them, I think this time from the World Bank, and it is now Uganda because they had passed some kind of a law outlawing homosexuality. So I guess it's the World Bank saying something like, you don't, uh, we don't like the way you, you know, your laws are, so you're not gonna get any loans anymore from, from us. And uh, maybe they should do what Niger said and tell them that they can take their aid and stick it where the sun doesn't shine. But guess what? Guess what? Uganda's probably just going to go to China 
to the BRICS nations or to Russia, and then they're going to take out a loan from them. Russia gives out a lot of loans. Russia is doing really well right now. If you haven't heard, they're now coming up with a bullet train. They've already got a fast train that goes between Moscow and St. Petersburg. And the time, which is a very long distance, by the way, um, it is like four hours and something. And that's going to cut the time down to like two hours. Two hours. And I don't know what kind of a distance that is. Maybe, I don't know, maybe it's like Washington, D.C. to Minnesota. I don't know. Maybe Miami to Chicago. I have no idea. But that sounds to me like it's... Uh, it's, it might be faster than taking an airplane because you don't have to maybe go through all the searches. I don't know if they, if inland, if they're, if they're searching everybody in the airplanes, like, uh, you know, every time you get, you have all this time, you got to be there at a certain time and waste huge amounts of time just to fly anywhere. I don't know. So it's a lot faster maybe to jump in a train. I think I'm going to get a kvass. Like I said, I'm done. And I think I have, yes, look at, look at the prices here. Let's see. One ruble and 90 kopeka for a half a liter of kvass. So two rubles. And what is two rubles? One dollar is um, like 270. So it's less than a dollar. I don't know, 75 cents. And it's sort of like beer, but no alcohol. It's very nice, very refreshing. Strange they don't have that, but probably never will have it in the United States because it's Russian. <laughs> but. Maybe that's about all I have to say today. You know, it's quite a bit. As you notice, I'm in a different place now. <clears throat> there was something that I forgot to say I should, should add. Actually, there's two points. One of them is that the leader of this country, he recently gave an interview, Alexander Lukashenko, and he was talking about how the Ukraine should sue for peace. Otherwise, there may not be a Ukraine, <clears throat> or at least there won't be enough for a functioning state. For example, they may lose Odessa as a port. And Lukashenko, for one, is probably a person that knows what it's like not having a port. And of course, uh, Belarus used to have some kind of license or an agreement uh, to be using the port at Klaipeda. In uh, is it Lithuania, Klaipeda, yeah, Klaipeda, um, in Latvia? No, Lithuania. God, I don't even know anymore. It's been a long time since I sent my container. But anyhow, what they did is they uh, first they started closing up the border, and when you're waiting for something, they had you wait for like a week or two weeks just to get across the border. <clears throat> to send a container, you know, and raising rental fees or something for the ports and all those kinds of things. Everything to make it as miserable as possible for Belarus, you know, until they, uh, I don't know what they were expecting. Were they expecting Belarus to coerce Russia to stop the military operation? I have no idea. Well, anyway, the whole idea is that Lukashenko was kind of saying, that Ukraine should sue for peace, and actually they should. But they see it. I don't, I don't know, I can kind of see how. They see it as liberating the Ukraine, this government that's in power now in Ukraine. But in truth, it's Russia that's trying to liberate Ukraine from this ideology that has taken over. This ideology of hatred and dominance, and of course that's been brewing in the Ukraine for decades, ever since the end of World War II, when, of course, as you, we all know now, they never did eradicate Nazism. So that's been flourishing, and it's, and a certain country from overseas that likes to use the most dastardly people, terrorists, or anyone they can in order to use them as useful idiots to take over the government. And then they think, at some point in time, maybe they can get rid of those people. They used this one guy named Osama bin Laden, and uh, they were trying to, I don't know, you, you guys know all the, the whole deal, and if you don't do what you're told to do, then you get removed from power. Talk to Panama about that one too. So, but 
like I said, Russia is in truth trying to liberate the Ukraine from all of this crap. And uh, yeah, but uh, the people, unfortunately, of Ukraine are being used as not even just proxies. Uh, they're being used as useful idiots, unfortunately, not only by their own crazy government, but also from the West. So it makes you really wonder if they're ever going to wake up and start to realize that these people are destroying their country. Maybe they'll even realize that these people from overseas actually see that as a goal, is to destroy their country and to kill off as many of their people as they can. They're so overjoyed that they're fighting to the last Ukrainian. They're going to be so happy when there's only one Ukrainian left. <laughs> so, and hopefully they can take a lot of Russians out with them. You know, they've even said that. So that's, that's one point I wanted to make. And there's another point I wanted to make. There is um, a person that came out. His name is Scott Bennett. He worked for the United States State Department. He was uh, one of the top people in their counterterrorism department. <clears throat> and he's a former employee of the State Department, by the way. I have to make, make clear on that. I don't want to be... Well, of course, this guy would be in trouble if he said what he said when he's still there. He wouldn't be there very long. He wouldn't be there probably more than a day if he said this stuff while he's still employed. But what he is saying, I can't necessarily say this on YouTube or else I'll get deleted. I've already been uh, canceled a couple times for saying this exact thing. You know, Victoria Newland can say this and a lot of other people can say this. Matter of fact, some people from other vlogs, they've even hinted very strongly and made sure that you knew exactly what was going on. And it's even in other videos from movie stars and things like that. Like I said, uh, uh, Jim Kivali, you know, who played Jesus in The Passion of the Christ for Mel Gibson, Mel Gibson and other roles. And he's, anyway, he's actually, he's come out of speaking out about a lot of ills in the world, child trafficking and for sex and organs and all that sort of thing. But let's not get into that one there. But anyhow, this person has come out again, you know, I mean, again, it's this subject, but this is just another person out of so very many people. And he's talking about that the United States is mentioning that there is an expanding realm of the, uh, they're expanding, there's biological threats are expanding. So in order to counter that, the United States has to build laboratories all over around certain countries like Iran and China and Russia and North Korea because of this expanding threat. So they have to go there and primarily what this person was saying, primarily is to get samples and to get us <laughs> not just the samples, but they get probably want to get the exact genetic blood samples and things so they could get exact what do they call that biological blueprints of even particular people that they possibly can in order to use this to invent you know cures cures for these sicknesses that have not yet come about that they that some are saying is impossible for them to ever ever exist but yet oh yes we saw from that one in 2019 that somehow just by magic some of these sicknesses can just come about you know they were studying these in University of North Carolina in Fort Detrick Maryland for up to what, 17, 15 years? 15 years before it actually surfaced. So they knew, they're very smart, you see that. And you know that Bill Gates, he's even told us that there's gonna be some more of those things because these people, they have a very well-working crystal ball. You know, and he bought all that farmland, old Billy, and uh, he didn't just do it for nothing just because he's got a crystal ball and knows what's gonna happen. Makes you wonder how that stuff happens. But anyway, he knows somehow yes so to to prevent before they happen 
all of these problems. The U.S. is making these labs all over the place around particular countries. Countries they want to be friends with, but they just won't cooperate, as you notice. They just won't cooperate, these countries, but they really desperately want to be friends with these countries, as you see. Yeah, but anyway, they're looking for specific, just like I was mentioning. I was mentioning this already many months ago, and of course now, lately, it's been coming out a lot more. <laughs> it's not like I have a crystal ball, but I'm luckily, um, I'm going to the right places and hearing the right things, and uh, so many people in other vlogs don't talk about this stuff. And I really don't know why, but some do. Some like, like, someone like John Mark Dugan, he, he talks about this stuff. But I think he's been canceled <laughs> and you know why he's been canceled so you have to get his telegram site I think it's called bad wolf wolf spelled with a V not with a W bad wolf and a lot of time he will be mentioning some of this stuff on his telegram channel so but yes the DNA they're looking for is Slavic Persian Hindu and Asian descent Mm -hmm. And that's really about all I wanted to say today. And that's about to where I'll end here. And if you haven't subscribed, please do so. And, um, or maybe hit the like. I guess that's supposed to do something. I don't know. I'm not really... But, you know, I, I just want to get the message out. I'm not really up on earning any money doing this and all that. Sure, everybody wants to have a little bit better income all the time, but it's not like it's anything that really drives me. And maybe some people are are really, I don't know what the word is, motivated or something to get a lot of views or things. Like I said, I could do that. Matter of fact, I might just do that. I might go where the young people are, start filming them and say, tell them it's on YouTube. And of course, they'll tell their friends, look, I'm on YouTube. And then you get a lot of subscribers. So I might do that because that's the only way that I would get subscribers there. I don't have Facebook or nothing like that, so I'm not going for anything and that sort of a thing. Most of you people are, uh, I think, 45 years old and older and uh, probably don't spend all day sitting on your device or your computer. But anyway, so that's about all I'll say today and no matter if I'll just show you something first. Work of art for welding, if you're into welding. Look at this. Looks like lights on there, so I guess that's lit up at nighttime. Can't afford that in Germany anymore since their energy bill's too high. We light up everything here in Belarus, I guess. I don't go out at night, so I'm not a, I'm not a night person. Matter of fact, I normally like to get up very early in the morning. I used to get up at four or so. Lately, I'm sleeping in very late, so I get up at about 5.15 normally in the morning. So I get up and I said, what, do, what is there to do? What do I need to do? I'm just kidding. So thanks for joining me and I'll see you on the next one. So bye for now.